Pastor Tim, I want to welcome you to Grace Church uh, today. Uh, if you are new and you received one of those bulletins on your way in, there's a perforated part called a connection card. If you would do us a favor to fill it out and take that back where you found it, that table in between the auditorium doors, we'd love to meet you officially and welcome you to Grace. We have something waiting for you there, so do us that kindness if you would. Uh, for those of you who call Grace Fellowship home, we can't do what we do without you doing what you do, and part of what you do uh, is supporting financially the work of Grace Church, and so there are ways that you can do that. You can find that on the bulletin as well. Uh, if you've been around for a while and you're ready to learn about Grace, uh, what we do, who we are, how we do what we do, there is an opportunity for you called Step In, August the 29th. Uh, you can sign up for that. Again, that's on that bulletin card uh, that you received. And then September the 12th is the launch of our next season of Rooted. And what is rooted, you might ask? Well, look at these side screens, and we'll tell you a little bit about rooted. Watch this. My name's Peyton. I took rooted uh, last spring, and I just wanted to share a couple of my experiences with you. Um, so when I first started rooted, or when I first heard about rooted, um, it was something that I wanted to do. Um, being a college student, I was a little bit weary about it because it was another, um, it was just another thing <laughs> that was on my schedule. But um, my parents and my family really wanted to kind of do this together. Um, so I was like, all right, let's do it. Um, Mom, if you want to pay for that, <laughs> I'll go ahead and join. <laughs> um, I was definitely a little bit nervous um, when I first walked in. It was nice though because I knew a lot of people in my group, but um, also I was in a group full of, you know, all older adults and I was the only younger person there. So we were definitely in different places in life and um, I was just kind of worried about what I was going to add to the mix, you know, what I could do for my group. Yeah, so I feel like being in a group full of adults, older adults, um, that was really nice for me. I kind of got, you know, talking about my experiences, they were able to kind of help me through that and they had more wisdom than I did um, with what I was going through and then I feel like I kind of gave them um, a little bit of an insight on what, you know, young adults were feeling. So I think the night that really stood out for me, um, every week we kind of went through everyone and we shared um, our story and kind of our testimony and when it was my night I was so nervous about it um, but it was really nice just because everyone kind of had something to say and uh, they just made me feel really loved and understood and they were just really there for me that night so that was really cool. When I first started Rooted I was just kind of getting out of like a really weird um, kind of part of my life uh, so I was confused and um, I just kind of felt like really lost I didn't really know what I was doing um, and I just kind of feel like Rooted gave me a little bit of a sense of direction and um, really just helped me get back to you know working on my relationship with God and um, getting back into the word and learning more what I would say is just to do it. Um, you really get a sense of community. Um, a lot of people from church um, kind of show up together and we go into our groups and it's just really nice getting to know uh, people. And then also with the devotionals we were given each week, um, the questions that they gave, they were really insightful and you kind of had to think about things a little bit harder. So Rooted is a 10-week experience that causes you to uh, process and learn about and experience and practice the various disciplines that get you more and more rooted in your faith and your relationship with Jesus, your walk with God. So if that's where you are, we would challenge you to check that out. Uh, you're not signing up indefinitely or you're signing uh, yourself up for the course as, as just 
express interest in that. Give us your name. Let us answer your questions for you. And we challenge you and invite you in this, uh, into this Rooted experience. It launches September 12th. So uh, think about it and uh, hope that you become a part of that. Before we get into the message, a uh, couple of things I, I want to mention uh, as well. Number one, yesterday was the back to school fair. All 650 backpacks uh, were given away uh, all because of Grace Church. So thank you for your generosity uh, with back to school. You can give yourself a hand. I just saw some. Okay. All right. Um, and this week, I, I just uh, had a brain freeze here. What was, what was the second thing? The second thing is that school starts this week. Some of you want to clap about that too. So um, <laughs> here's the thing. If you are part of the school system, whether you're a teacher, an administrator, whatever, uh, a part of, of the upper thing, or if you're a student of whatever school, whatever level, if you're, if you're a part of the educational system, I want you to stand right now. Just stand. Stand where you are. Anybody? Teachers? Students? All right, and we just want to take a moment uh, to pray for them uh, and to ask God's uh, blessing on their life and guidance in their life as they enter into this new uh, school year. So would you uh, join me in prayer? Let's pray. Father, thank you for those standing in this room. Uh, thank you uh, for the plan that you have for them that is not yet revealed to them. But we pray, Father, that that plan, as you have promised, uh, will be prosperous and full of hope, uh, that you will bless their efforts uh, as they, Father, Allow them, give them opportunities to be salt and light wherever you have placed them in whatever situation, Father. Uh, may they be your representative in that spot. And so we ask for your strength, courage, uh, perseverance, patience, wisdom, guidance, all that they need uh, to prosper in this next educational year. And to that end, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said... Amen. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we are in this series this summer uh, entitled One Hit Wonders. We have taken your favorite verses, many, some of them, uh, and we're unpacking those verses for you. T today, we are looking at Job chapter 1, verse 21. Job 1, 21. We'll put it on the screen. I want all of us to read this verse out loud together. Here we go. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be his name. Question, are you in a giving season right now where you feel like the Lord is blessing you, prospering you, or are you in a taking season where you feel like the Lord is maybe pruning you or, you know, working, the, you know, he's downsizing you and you don't think like you, you need to be downsized, but, you know, he's doing, he's doing a work in your life. Are you in a giving season or a taking season? Because you I just assume that you're in one of those or you're transitioning between the two because that's, that's what life is, right? Life is a series of giving and taking. Life is a series of up, up and downs, good and bad, blessings and curses. Uh, we have a time where God seems to be prospering our lives and a time where God is pruning our lives. What season are you in? Because here's the thing. Some of you will need to hear what I have to say today. And others of you will need to hear what I have to say today and file it away for tomorrow. Because we've been there, we're going there, or we're in between these two. Problems are my profession. What I do, I often find myself in situations where you're looking to me to bring some type of comfort or stability or resolution to the crisis that you're facing in your life. As long as people suffer, I have job security. I don't like that, but that's what God has called me to do. But there's nothing more certain than that people will have seasons of suffering, seasons of struggle, You've struggled, you will struggle. Are you struggling? One of the best ways to illustrate this, I think, is um, when I was a kid, maybe as, as a child, you played this game called musical chairs. It's a popular birthday game. You know, you invited 11 of your friends, so there's 12 friends in your house. They all brought you presents. They ate your cake and ate your ice cream. And now and, uh, what do we do? Okay, well, let's set up 11 chairs in a circle and let's dance around these chairs. So you set up the chairs, you play the music, and everybody's marching around these chairs until someone shuts the music off and the survival of the fittest sets in. All human aggression breaks loose. It doesn't matter, happy birthday, boy, but you're, I'm shoving you out of the way because here's the lesson of the evolutionary world. There's not enough chairs. There's not enough chairs in life. And so you got to do what you, you do to get, to get your chair. 
doesn't matter how wealthy or educated you are. It doesn't matter where you live or how you live. It doesn't matter how much you juice or jog, you know, vitamin up, get your yoga on. It doesn't really matter. You're going to have a time where you don't feel like there's a chair for you. Tim Keller writes, no matter what precautions we take, no matter how well we have put together a good life, no matter how hard we have worked to be healthy, wealthy, wise, comfortable with our friends and family, successful with our career, something will inv- inevitably ruin it. You have a good day today? Nah, you'll have a bad one tomorrow. Welcome to Grace. You know, life is tragic. Aren't you glad you came today? But that's the thing, friends. It should surprise no one, right? We know this to be true about life. Like Job, we all realize that there are times when we feel like the Lord is giving us and then where the Lord is taking from us. And, but maybe unlike Job, we find it difficult. We struggle in the struggle. It's, it's hard for us to say in that season of loss, blessed be the name of the Lord. How did he do that? It sounds so trite, doesn't it? It sounds so simplistic. Is Job in denial? How can he say, case or all, do whatever you want, God, I bless your name. You know, you're awesome. I'm fine with it. Well, not so fast. Job had his struggles. He struggled with struggle. And for you and me, nothing causes us to question the love of God and or the power of God more than the inevitable struggles that we struggle with in life. If God is love, why this? Why now? Why me? We always ask the why questions. You know people, innocent people, good people, undeserving people who have inexplicable things, struggles in their lives, things they don't deserve, things that are far more than their share, right? I mean, if God is in control, why doesn't he do something about that? Why doesn't he fix that situation? Where is he when we struggle? Well, at the very beginning of the story of Job, it tells us that Job was a blameless guy. He was upright. He feared God and shunned evil. He was one of the good ones. He was faithful. He honored God. And everything was taken from him. I mean, if he was a wife cheater and a child beater, we all understand, but that's not the case with Job. He's a good one. And God had blessed him. He was rich. He had lots of land and livestock. He had a happy, a big, happy family. He's enjoying the blessing, the prosperity of God. The Lord has given and Job is blessing the name of the Lord. That's, of course, a no-brainer, right? It's easy to love God when God gives you what you want. In fact, that's the argument that Satan takes to God on Job's uh, Targeting Job, of course Job loves you. Look at all the stuff he gets from you. Take all that away and he'll turn into a different guy, which is exactly what happens. Job turns into a different guy, just not the kind of guy that Satan anticipated. Friends, suffering changes you. Job had everything taken from him. He loses everything but God. He is left only with God. And that's when he realizes that God is enough, that God sometimes gives and God sometimes takes away. But blessed be the name of my God. The issue of suffering, friends, is both a philosophical question and it is also a personal dilemma on both ends of this issue. Every faith system, every worldview is forced to grapple with the existence of evil, the reason for pain and suffering. If you're a thinking person, you have thought about this. You have struggled with this struggle. Why is there suffering in the world? Who's responsible for it? What can be done about it? And this, by the way, is the easiest way to argue for the non-existence of God. You've had friends, maybe you were at that point, maybe you're at that point where, you know what? I don't know that God exists. Why? Well, here's the, here's the argument. If God is all good, he would destroy evil. If God is all powerful, he could destroy evil. But evil is not destroyed. Therefore, there is no God. Friends, that's a logical argument, but it's not a satisfactory argument. Uh, It falls short of the argument because from a Christian worldview, from a Christian perspective, this argument leaves out some very basic facts about the universe and about human nature as we understand it. There's a fabric to the world created by a God of order. And he created man in his image out of love, for love, so that we would have the freedom to love him back. And when we chose not to love him back, I mean, just read the first three chapters of the Bible. It explains all of this. When we sinned against God, we set in motion the breakdown of everything God intended. Everything God called good is now defiled. The the garden is defiled. The world is broken. Our lives are broken. Everything is falling apart. But God has left us without hope. The gospel, we have the gospel that assures us that one day all things will be set right, that all things will be made new. But in the meantime, until then, we struggle. 
Even those who believe in it doesn't matter if you believe in God or not. All of us, all of humankind struggle because of the brokenness of this world. But God is able to produce a purpose that is ultimately good. That's the Christian worldview. Friends, a lot of people use suffering as an argument to prove that God does not love us or that God is not capable. Of. But if you're a Jesus follower, and my purpose is not to dig into the philosophical side of this argument, except to say, friends, the problem of evil is actually a bigger problem for those who reject God than it is for us who believe in the God of the Bible. Jesus follower, you don't have to be afraid of this argument or back away from this issue because the problem of evil is actually a bigger problem for those who don't have God in their argument because God created us to love us. And when we chose not to love him and broke everything in the world, that's where all of our struggle comes from. And Jesus has come to set us free from that brokenness, to heal us from that brokenness, and to make all things right. Until then, we struggle. So this is what you come back with, with that person who says God doesn't exist because of problems in the world. You recognize evil, right? You acknowledge suffering. You call certain things good. You call certain things bad. Why do you do that? If there is no God, why would you call anything good or bad? Why would you recognize suffering? Isn't that, I mean, if we're just a random collection of chemicals caught in an evolutionary process, why do you call anything suffering? Isn't that just what is? Nature is all there is, then nothing is more natural than pushing each other out of the way and grabbing our own chair. <laughs> the weak giving way to the strong. So, that, in a very small nutshell, is the philosophical question, the problem that most of, all of us have to face and grapple with. But for most of us, most of our struggle is not on the philosophical side, it's on the personal side. We don't grapple so much as to why there is suffering in the world. We struggle with why is there suffering in my life, right? Why this? Why now? Why me? Most of us grapple so why does God allow this? Or why is God putting this in? You know, where is this coming from? And what is God doing with this? The question is not why is there suffering? The question is why am I suffering? Right? You're looking for a chair and there is no chair. Or the chair has been pulled out from you, from under you. Where's my chair? A couple of weeks ago, someone asked me for a book recommendation because they were going through a particular struggle. And I referred to them, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, A Grief Observed. Uh, if you, uh, I would encourage you to read that book. But before you read that book, hang on. C.S. Lewis was one of the greatest Christian apologists in the previous century. He came to faith as an adult academic. He was a professor and a writer. He wrote the Chronicles of Narnia. He wrote two books, actually, on suffering. The Problem of Pain in 1940, and then 20 years later, A Grief Observed. His first book, The Problem of Pain, Lewis lays out the philosophical argument. He lays out an intellectual, theological answer to the question of pain. It's articulate, it's, it's, it's organized, it's clear, it's compelling. He had all the answers to the problem of pain. And then his wife died. Suffering changes us, right? And so what was philosophical in the problem of pain became quite personal in a grief observed. Didn't change the explanation, just changed the experience. What was three or theoretical suddenly became real to C.S. Lewis. The truth of what Lewis believed in 1940 didn't change with his book in 1961. It just changed him. So for us, let's take this a little further. Many of you, you're Jesus followers, you love God, you believe in the Bible. And so like Job, you're not ready to give up on God because you're having a tough time. You just don't understand. You're struggling with the struggle that he's allowing in your life. It's deeply personal for you. And at times you almost feel schizophrenic in your, any schizophrenic believers in the room? You're not alone if you are. And I would suggest that at times you are. Think of David. David who wrote the Psalms, you know, you're familiar with the Psalms. David loved God. He followed God. He embraced God. I, I'm so in love with you, God. I praise you. I worship you. I adore you. How majestic is your name in all the earth? Turn the page. Where are you? <laughs> and what are you doing? On one page, I trust you. I put my hope in you. Turn the page. How long? How long, oh Lord? How long? How, how, do you, how can I make sense of what you're doing in my life? And David was not alone. Moses? <laughs> 
what a bum rap. I mean, he didn't want to go in the first place, but he ended up going. And for 40 years, he served in the desert with people who would not cooperate. He gets, he gets to the, the edge of the promised land and God says, Moses, look at this. Not you. You won't go in. Just, you know, just look. Can't touch. Jeremiah, he's a piece of work. God comes to Jeremiah and says, if you go where I tell you to go, you say what I tell you to say, I will give you the power to build nations. Who wouldn't say yes to that? And then every time Jeremiah opens his mouth, he gets beat up. <laughs> gets thrown in mud pits. One time he's, he's thrown in a, in, t- in a ditch, naked, beaten up, and he gets out of that ditch and he says, you know what, God, I think you tricked me. <laughs> you deceived me. I mean, this is the point, isn't it? I mean, we believe in a loving God and a powerful God, a God who has a plan for us. A good, I mean, Jeremiah 29, 11, who doesn't love that verse? I have a plan for you that's good and full of hope. Jeremiah wrote that <laughs> in his exile and his suffering. So when it comes to suffering, folks, I think we, maybe we just need to read our Bibles more. John the Baptist paved the way for the Messiah, gets his head cut off in prison. You want that life? The problem is we see that. We know that. We talk about that. We just don't think that that's ever going to happen to us. How could a God who loves me ever allow me that experience? That's how entitled we are, right? The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. How, what, what are you going to do about that? Stephen is stoned to death. Peter and John, they're often persecuted. The apostle Paul, I mean, read 2 Corinthians. There's nothing that challenges your faith more and it will either cause you to cling to or question the love of God, the power of God. And like King David, one moment you're praising and blessing the name of the Lord, and the next moment you're questioning the power of that name. It's just a struggle, isn't it? We struggle with struggle. There are people who have never come to faith because of struggle. And there are people who have walked away from their faith because of struggle. You have experienced it in yourself. You have witnessed it in others. When it comes to suffering, some people get through it and come out the other end with a depth of character and joy that you never thought possible. And then others have come through it, but bitter and angry and cynical about life and critical about faith. Suffering changes people. Friends, what is the gospel? What is the good news of the gospel? Here it is, and Job found it. The good news is that you get God a God that you do not deserve, a loving, powerful God that you could not earn. And if you end up with nothing else but God, you will find that God is enough for you. The Lord will give and the Lord will take away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So for those of you who struggle with struggle, what can we learn from struggling to lead us to that faith that Job had? Because here's the deal, friends. There's no one in this room who is exempt. There's no one in this room right now whose life cannot be radically changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye with one phone call, with one show up at the door, with one diagnosis, with one decision that went wrong. So how can we, with with whatever God does, when he gives, when he takes away, how can we truly say with Job, may you be praised, may you be, blessed be your name. Well, friends, if we're receptive to what God does in our lives, his love and his power, here's four things that suffering can do for us. Number one, it will expose what we love. Suffering exposes what I love. All suffering is loss and nothing exposes love like loss. Sometimes we don't realize how much we loved it until we've lost it. Anybody here watch the Olympics? I've watched some of the Olympics. There's a lot of crying in the Olympics. You know, did you realize that? I mean, when you're watching the Olympics, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you know, losers cry, of course, but winners cry too. I mean, and I, I've watched some of the Olympics. I haven't cried yet. <laughs> the Olympics doesn't, I mean, you know, no amount of medals is going to affect my life. So I'm just, I'm just watching it. But something happened to my kids or my wife my job, my friends, or my health. I'll I'll let you in on something, folks. I'm a runner. Many of you know that. I I love to run. I need to run. I haven't run since April. I've had back problems all summer. Ask my family. I'm not going to tell you. Just ask my family how cranky I can get when I can't do what I want. I feel for those 
who are physically struggling chronically. Suffering reveals what really sits at the throne of your life. Why does not running, why does not running bother me or matter to me? Because that's what, I, that's what I love to do. That's what I enjoy doing. That's what I need to do for my own physical health. And when I can't do that, it bothers me because it matters to me. What, matter, what matters to you? What matters to you? Sometimes you don't realize what matters to you until God says, you know what? Let's take that away for a while or let's take away that for good. Satan stands before God and says, Job only loves you because of what you've given him. Stop being so good to him and he will change. And Job actually changed. Job learned through suffering to love God for God and nothing else. Second Corinthians, Paul writes this. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, and he's, the, the purpose that we have found in this, what God was wanting to do in us because of this, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. Learning to rely only on God. Who do you, question, who do you love more than anything else in the world? What do you love more than anything else in the world? What is that one thing or that one person, that one relationship, that one issue in your life that if you lost that, everything would be lost? Your will to go on, your purpose, your meaning for life, your joy, your peace. I've been married to the same woman for 45 years, which is pretty remarkable given that, I, given that I am not her only love. I'm not even her first love. I found that out a long time ago. And actually, she's not number one on my list either. So it works well. Uh, friends, that's a secret to a happy marriage, and that's exactly what you want. Let me explain. No human being can bear the weight of someone loving them more than anything in the world. No human being can live up to that kind of pressure. They were not made for that. You were made to love God and to love him first and to love him most. And so when you love God, when you love Jesus first and most, first of all, that's what enables me to love my wife. That's certainly what enables her to love me. (laughs) But secondly, loving Jesus first and most enables me to go on. Should God, should, I mean, God is the one that gave me that woman. God has the power to take that woman away. What, what, what will happen? What will happen when that happens? Yeah, I'll be overwhelmed, probably beyond my ability to endure so that I will learn to rely on God who raises the dead. You understand what I'm saying? If you love anything more than God, your life will fall apart when you lose that one thing. Suffering changes people. And again, you've seen this, people who have stopped living because of loss. The suffering was too much for them and they've grown bitter and angry and cynical and they blame God for not being good or loving or powerful. Friends, when when God is your life, when Jesus is your life, will you suffer? Of course you will. Will you lose hope? Friends, when you love God most, no amount of suffering can rob you of the life that he's given you. When you love him most, that love cannot be taken from you. So that's the first thing. Suffering exposes what you love. Here's the second thing. It shapes who you are becoming. Suffering shapes who you are becoming. Suffering will either make you or break you. It will deepen you or it will destroy you. It will refine you like fire or will it, it will incinerate you like the same sun that melts wax hardens clay. Don't waste your sufferings. Don't waste your sufferings, friends. This is the gospel. Jesus became one of us. He entered into our experience. He identified with our sufferings. Understand this. Jesus suffered, not so that we would not suffer, but that when we suffered, we could suffer like him, that we would become like him. James writes about this in chapter one. He says, you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Let perseverance finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, not lacking anything, or in some translations, you become perfect and how God is making you, how how you're becoming the testing of your faith. We prayed for those in school. You know, the next nine months, there's going to be a lot of testing. What's the purpose of testing? Who who benefits from that? Who Who is the testing for? Here's the thing. The Bible talks a lot about testing and refining, but not in the terms of like you and I passing a test so that we'll become acceptable to God. That's not what that's about. Friends, you're already acceptable to God. Testing isn't for God's benefit to see what you're made of. Testing is for your benefit to see what you're made of. First of all, to expose what you love. Second of all, to show where you need 
to grow, show what you need to sacrifice, show what you need to pursue. Job understood this. In chapter 23, verse 10, he says, he knows, God knows the way that I take. When he has tested me, I will come forth like gold, the purifying process of gold, taking out all of the dross, all the stuff that is not gold. This image of uh, testing is all through the Bible. Psalm 66, Jeremiah 9, Zechariah 13, I will refine them purify them and test them. Isaiah 48, 10, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Wow, that's a powerful verse. And I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Even Jesus said, Mark 9, 49, that everyone will be salted with fire. Salted with, get that image, salted with fire. James says, let perseverance, allow perseverance and embrace the process of suffering so that it might produce in you the right kind of change. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said, to live is to suffer. So number one, you will suffer. You can't get around it. Number two, suffering will change you. You can't avoid it. But number three, how you change, how it changes you depends on you, depends on what you do with that suffering, what you allow God to do in your suffering. So don't waste your suffering. You you will never know how patient you are until your patience is tested, right? Why do you pray for patience? Because you don't have it, because your patience has been tested. You will never know how honest you are until you're tempted to cheat. You never know how you, you think you're a loving person, let God place a hard, hard to love person in your life and find out how loving you are. Oswald Chambers in his book, My Utmost for His Highest writes, God does not give us an overcoming life. God does not give us an overcoming life. He gives us life as we overcome. If there is no strain, there is no strength. All through the Bible, it makes the point that suffering can do for you, for your character, for your life, what fire can do to silver and gold. It can grow you, mature you, strengthen you, perfect you, and equip you. That's the next point, friends. Suffering makes you useful to a broken world, in a broken world. Because only those who are broken can bless a broken world. Many of you have found this to be true. Many of you have found your purpose in life in the pain you have experienced in life. You've discovered what God has for you in this life because of the things he's brought you through in life. So how many times have you been in a situation where people have, you know, offered those superficial platitudes and pat answers and, oh, I know how you're feeling. I know exactly what you're going through and you're thinking you have no idea of what I'm dealing with. And that may or may not be true. But the point is, friends, we always relate to those who have suffered like us. And we are most compelled by those who have come out the other end, tested by fire and come through like gold. 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the God of com- compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort. The purpose of your comforting is to comfort those in trouble with the comfort you have received from God. The word comfort, don't misunderstand this. It sounds like a fuzzy pe- pair of slippers. It's not. It, the word comfort here means to encourage or to instill courage. It's the word for fortress or to fortify. When you encourage someone, you are putting courage in that person, fortifying them for the challenge that they need to face. When you're facing your greatest challenge, you need courage. And where do you get that courage? You get that from fellow strugglers. We are agents of grace to one another. Paul is saying here that one of the purposes of the community of faith is to pass around courage. You've gone through it. You help someone else go through it. So let me, you know, one of the best ways to suffer is to help others suffer. One of the biggest problems that we have in suffering is that we isolate ourselves. We grow inward. We go inward in our struggles, which just exacerbates our pain. So one of the ways to find comfort is to give comfort. You're lonely, find someone who's lonely and befriend them. You're hurting, find someone who's hurting and love on them. You're struggling, find someone who struggles. It won't be hard. And walk through that struggle together. Embrace your brokenness and bless a broken world. Suffering equips you to bless. And here's the last thing. Suffering deepens your gratitude and joy. (laughs) How does that work? Friends, this is a kingdom principle that the world doesn't understand, but people of faith realize that the world is not our home and this life is not all there is. And so what, what suffering does is it reminds us of what is good in our lives. It reminds us of who God is in our lives. It reminds us of what we take for granted. It reminds us that everything is a gift. James says, consider it pure joy. Consider it pure joy. 
Paul says in Romans 8 that our sufferings aren't worth comparing to the glory that is in store for us. In 2 Corinthians, he says that our suffering actually produces that glory, produces that joy. How, do, how, do, how does that happen? I mean, what does that mean? Well, for those of you who are parents, uh, have you ever lost your kid, misplaced your child? <laughs> You know, they've wandered off in the mall or the, you know, Disney World or, you know, some state park. They've been with you all day. They have irritated you all day. They're hanging on you all day. You know, why don't you go find something to do yourself? And so they do, and now you can't find them. And so after hours of searching and fearing for their safety, you find that child, and you lay your head down on the pillow that night. Well, you've always loved that child. <laughs> but that love is just a tad different today, right? You've always been grateful for that child, but at the prospect of losing that child, your gratitude, well, it's just a little different, right? It deepens our gratitude and our joy. Friends, suffering doesn't just make you a better person. It makes everything that God has of you better. It makes heaven a better place. I don't sit, I never sit at a funeral service without reminding myself of how good heaven is going to be. And the older I get, the better it becomes. It helps you to realize that everything is a gift. God, God gives and God takes away and his name above all is to be blessed. So here's the question. You know, uh, the question is not, will you suffer? To live is to suffer. There will be suffering. Jesus said, in this life, you will have trouble. The question is not, will you suffer? The question is, how, are we su how will we suffer well? How, are we to not wa how can we not waste our sufferings? Let me very quickly give you three things. Number one, don't go it alone. When you suffer, don't isolate. So often in our suffering, we do the very thing that makes our suffering worse. We get off by ourselves, we go off into a dark corner and we convince ourselves that we're, we're the only ones who have ever gone through this. We're the only ones who have suffered like this. Job is a great model for us in this. When Job lost everything, what did he do? First of all, he went to God with his struggle. He struggled with God. He argued with God. He Friends, God is not, he can take it. Job went to God and then he went to his friends. Read the story of Job. Now, Job's friends could have been better, but he still utilized his friends because we're all imperfect. And so we all grieve better when we grieve in community. So don't go it alone. That's the first thing. Second thing, don't resist the process. Don't waste your, don't waste your sufferings. We believe in a suffering Savior. We believe Jeff, Jesus suffered for us and that he's suffering with us so that in our suffering, he can mold us into more and more of his character. There's a lot riding on how you suffer. So suffer well, don't resist the process. And here's the final thing, Just don't give up hope. Don't give up hope. Heaven is waiting for you. And in every, every experience of suffering, we're always tempted to ask those two basic questions. I'm, I'm hurting, I'm going through this, I'm struggling. So does, God, do you love me? And God, can you do something? Do you love me? Can you do something? And I wanna tell you friends, doesn't matter what you're go you've gone through. It doesn't matter what you're going through. The cross has already answered that question for you. The cross has already told you that God loves you. The cross has already told you that God has done something about it. The cross has already told us that bad things will ultimately work out for our good. The cross has told us that the ultimate things will never be taken from us. The cross has told us that the best is yet to come. Hunger for heaven. Naked I came from my mother's womb. And that's exactly how I'm going to go. And in this life, there will be blessings, there will be prosperity, there will be good things. And in this life, there will be sufferings and struggles and loss. And through it all, the name of the Lord is to be praised. Amen? And let's pray about that. Father, we thank you that you are a God of goodness, a God of love a God of prosperity, but you are also a God of pruning. And that whatever suffering comes into our lives, your purpose is to prune us and to purify us and to prepare us for heaven. So Father, we look to you and we live in this community of faith to help one another through that. We submit ourselves to your process and our hope is in you. 
that in one day you will make all things right and make all things new. Until then, Father, we rest in the name of our Savior, our sufferer, Jesus. Amen.